Shalom from Israel to all of the Daystar viewers around the world. I'm Moshe Bartzvi, the producer and founder of Israel Now News. We at Israel Now News are dedicated to bringing you the full story and the truth about Israel from Israel. It's written in the Holy Bible when David said in Psalm 25:5, Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And God says in Zechariah 8.16, These are the things that you shall do. Speak out the truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment to peace in your gates. And always search for the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John 8.31 I hope you enjoyed the program. God bless you from Jerusalem. Shalom, shalom. Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rom. And I'm Erin Viner. In our top story, Israel is heading to elections. Last week, members of the Israeli Knesset voted unanimously for the dissolution of the legislative body. The 18th Israeli Knesset opened its winter session on Monday and disbanded just a few hours later. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced that the country would hold general elections early rather than wait for the latter part of 2013 to restructure the government. Knesset Speaker Ruvain Rivlin opened the winter session by saying, We have gathered here today to disband. In the next few hours, the session that has just opened will end. He went on to say that while many Israelis do not understand why it is important to elect a new cabinet, elections are the inevitable result of a healthy and vital democratic debate. Israeli leaders from across the political spectrum will now be spending the upcoming months solidifying their platforms and vying for party membership. Critical issues facing the next government will include the Iranian nuclear threat and the local economy. The 18th Knesset voted last week to hold general elections on January 22nd of next year. The Arab Lawyers Union, a collective of bar associations and legal societies, decided last week to honor one of the most ruthless Palestinian suicide bombers in history. The Cairo-based ALU, which represents lawyers from 15 different countries, voted to honor Hanadi Jaradat, who killed 22 people and wounded 51 in a suicide bombing in Israel in 2003. Jaradat was a law student in Janine and was just weeks away from becoming a lawyer when she blew herself up at the Maxim restaurant in Haifa. Representatives of the ALU visited the terrorist family and said that their organization was proud of what she did in defense of Palestine and the Arab nation. The spiritual leader of Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood, Mohammed Badai, has called on all of the group's supporters to take up arms and fight Israel for total control of Jerusalem. Anti-Israel rhetoric has increased exponentially since the Muslim Brotherhood was elected to power in Egypt earlier this year. In his sermon this week, Badai demanded that Egyptians loyal to the Islamic extremist group join the Jihad for Jerusalem, saying that doing so is an obligation for all Muslims. More evidence which exposes the regime of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad for brutally murdering innocent civilians has surfaced. A report released by Human Rights Watch states that Syrian forces have dropped cluster bombs over heavily populated civilian areas of Syria. Cluster bombs have been banned by most countries, and the UN Director of Human Rights Watch said, Syria's disregard for its civilian population is all too evident in its air campaign, which now apparently includes dropping these deadly cluster bombs into populated areas. Germany's Der Spiegel weekly news magazine has published a disturbing report detailing Iran's possible plans for environmental terrorism, citing Western intelligence sources the article stated that the hardline Islamic Republic's Revolutionary Guards have devised a plan to create an environmental disaster in the Persian Gulf called Operation Murky Waters, involving the sabotaging of an oil tanker in the Gulf, pollution of the narrow channel, and making traffic through the Strait of Hormuz nearly impossible. This move would force the Western nations, who are now imposing crippling sanctions against the Iranian economy, to suspend those efforts in order to take part in a massive cleanup operation. The State of Israel has one of the best health care systems in the world. According to a preliminary report from the Organization for Economic Development, Israeli health care has seen a huge improvement since 1995 when the national health insurance law came into effect. 
Professor Roni Gamzu, Director General of the Israeli Health Ministry, expressed satisfaction with the report and said that he will work to improve the system using the recommendation of the team from the OECD. Former captive IDF soldier Gilad Shalit has granted his first televised interview in Israel since his release one year ago. Shalit was abducted and held hostage by Hamas terrorists in Gaza for more than five years. He told Israel's Channel 10 that he passed his time in captivity by making lists, trying to keep up with sports, and drawing maps of Israel in his hometown of Mitzpeh Hila. He also occasionally played chess and dominoes with his captors, and also played makeshift athletics with shirts or socks rolled into balls to pass the time. Member nations of the European Union have collectively agreed to adopt increased sanctions against Iran's banking, shipping, and industrial sectors. The EU ministers released a joint statement saying that they had serious and deepening concerns over the Islamic Republic's nuclear ambitions and that the restrictive measures are aimed at affecting Iran's nuclear program and revenues of the Iranian regime to fund its program. For the first time in history, the Pope's weekly address from the Vatican has been translated into Arabic. In an apparent outreach to the Muslim population of the Middle East, Pope Benedict XVI actually spoke in Arabic at the beginning of his address and then had the remainder of the sermon translated. According to a statement released by the pontiff, the decision to use the language was meant as a display of the church's concern for Christians in the Middle East and to encourage Muslims and Christians to work for peace in the region. The Iranian security services have begun systematically rooting out and dismantling churches in the hardline Islamic Republic. According to reports in the Iranian media, leaders of underground churches have been arrested and their churches were destroyed. The Fars News Agency reported that the Christians were trying to influence impressionable Iranians, ultimately attempting to convert them to Christianity. It said a network of criminals were caught taking advantage of vulnerable people. It went on to stress that most of the people attracted to these churches come from weak and vulnerable segments of society who have psychological, emotional, and economic problems. A later report by Fars blamed Israel, saying that the illegal network of churches is affiliated to Zionist propaganda. A recent study by the Hebrew University of Jerusalem reveals that Jews make up less than 0.2 of 1% of mankind. The study revealed that last year, the global Jewish population increased by 88,000 people, among which just 166,296 were born in Israel. Today, there are 13.75 million Jews worldwide, 43% of whom live in Israel making the Promised Land the epicenter of the world's largest Jewish community. In light of the crippling economic crisis in the Palestinian Authority, Israel has increased the number of work permits which allow Palestinians to legally work inside Israel. This year, Israel has authorized 10,000 additional permits, which makes a total of 40,000, in addition to 25,000 in Judea and Samaria. This is the highest number of Israeli work permits given to Palestinians since the first Intifada was launched in 1987. And that concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here on the luxurious Daystar studio overlooking the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Our guest today is Pastor Larry Huck, Senior Pastor of New Beginnings in Dallas. Pastor Huck, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I love being here. Pastor Huck, your church is unique in that it's just so overwhelming pro-Israel. What is your message to the church that has made it so strong on the issue of Israel? Well, Josh, we've, we've discovered through the scriptures that God says, without, without a shadow of a doubt, in Genesis chapter 12, I will bless those who bless you concerning Israel, and I will curse those who curse you. And as we begin to study the scriptures, it, it, the whole Bible took on a different meaning when I begin to realize the Jewishness of Jesus, the Jewishness of Paul, the teachings that God gives us in his word that come from Israel. And when we study it as it comes from Israel, as it comes from 
the Jewish understanding of God, it obviously brings us back to not only loving God's word, but loving the land and the people in the land. What's been amazing is that you have a real deep relationship with the Jewish community in Dallas as well. You've been able to really bridge that gap. Why do you think that Jews and Christians are coming together in Dallas right now? Well, I think it's one, it's the timing of the Lord. It is absolutely a miracle time of God. This is, this is in Hebrew, it's called the Moadim, an appointed time. There's a window that God has opened up and God is putting in the hearts of Christians around the world. It is absolutely amazing putting it in the hearts of Christians around the world to love the people of Israel, to love the land of Israel. And, you know, we think maybe that's a, a light thing, but everywhere we go as we're in Israel, we see people, Jewish people, when they hear that, begin to cry because for many years they thought we hated them that they were the enemy and all of a sudden they're realizing that not only America the country but the Christians of America and Christians around the world love Israel love the Jewish people and this is God's timing in end times now you know uh, Christian support for Israel is the cornerstone of political support for Israel from America absolutely how much influence will Christian support have on this upcoming election Christians got to understand exactly what the Bible says. The Bible says concerning the Jewish people, concerning Israel, and everybody in America, every Christian, white, black, brown, has got to understand how important this election is. God says, I will bless those who bless you. I will, I will God, Almighty God, will bless a land, an individual who blesses Israel and blesses the Jewish people. But the opposite side, and we've got to realize God's word in that is just as true as John 3.16 of calling upon the Lord as our Messiah, as our Savior. God says, if you come against Israel, if you come against the Jewish people, I will curse you. And, and I have to say that, I'm, you know, Josh, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican, I'm a believer in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I'll not vote up for a party, but I'll vote for an individual. And we see President Obama turning his back on Israel, turning his back on the Jewish people. On the other side, we see Romney making a stand for Israel, making a stand for the Jewish people. We see Obama bowing to the enemies of Israel, and we see Romney standing for Israel. And we've got to understand, America will not stand if they turn their back on Israel. The reason America is the greatest nation in the world is because they've loved Israel. If we turn our back on that, America will lose the blessing and the anointing of God. What's also very interesting is you have a show on Daystar, and in most of your teaching, not most, but some, you actually speak about Shabbat, the feast, you say words in Hebrew. What kind of response have you seen from people who watch your show? Well, it's amazing from Jewish people and also uh, Christian people that they're realizing that Jesus was a Jew, Paul was a Jew, the Bible, the Bible wasn't written in Greek, the New Testament wasn't written in Greek, it was spoken in Aramaic or Hebrew. And you know, the scripture says that in the last days, there, the two will become one new man. It'll be one wall built, the, the temple of God will one wall be built on the apostles, the New Testament, one wall built on the prophets, the Old Testament, and that God will tear down the wall and bring Jew and Gentile together to serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Josh, I've been teaching this for 18 years, but in the last three years, there has been a uh, a, a wave of God's people opening their hearts, both Jew and Gentile. I, I not only have a program on Daystar, but I get invited to speak in synagogues and to Jewish people during Hanukkah, and they're just, they just love seeing God bring us together and, and not be going parallel, but coming together, and it's an end time prophecy. Uh, Pastor Huck, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? I would say that right now, this is the most important time, literally the most important time in history for the land of Israel, for America, and for the world. We serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Whether you're Jew or Christian, it is the same God. 
For us that are Christians, Jesus has paid the price that we can be grafted into the land of Israel. And I want to encourage everybody, as you look at this holy land, to get this year to get out and vote. And to vote, I'm going to say it, to vote for Romney. Whether you're white or black, it's not about being politically correct. It's about being biblically correct. And Josh, we have a candidate that we know by the name of Romney that will stand for the Jewish people and stand for Israel. And that means that God will still release his blessing on America. Our greatest days are yet to come. Thank you, Pastor Huck, for being on the show. Thank you, sir. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. Up next, Shining Light from Israel. Today, Israel is facing a threat unparalleled in world history. Not only is our existence as the state of Israel in danger, but the lives of millions of our citizens, over half of world Jewry, are at the risk of being snuffed out by a genocidal dictator. Iran today is on the verge of completing its nuclear arsenal to accomplish exactly that aim. As arguably the oldest nation on the planet, if there is one thing we have learned from the past, it is that we must never leave our fate in the hands of others. On May 13, 1939, a ship carrying 930 Jewish refugees set sail from Hamburg, Germany, the USS St. Louis. Jews fleeing for their lives, who left everything behind to escape Adolf Hitler. After paying for their visas, they were promised entrance into Cuba. But when the ship arrived, the passengers of the St. Louis were denied asylum. Realizing they had nowhere to go, the ship turned north in hopes that they would find safe haven in the United States and docked off the coast of Florida, desperately hoping for salvation. Not only were they callously denied, but the U.S. sent armed Coast Guard ships, forcing them to keep a distance from the Floridian shores. The leaders of the Jewish community pleaded with President Roosevelt to save these 930 Jews from the hands of Hitler. They were told that America had reached the quota of German immigrants for the year. They pleaded with the American administration. They begged to mortgage the quota for future years. Anything but to send them back to be murdered at the hands of the Nazis. But the Jewish community leaders were told that the regulations on immigration could not be changed. So the Jews on the St. Louis were turned away. The ship, now running low on food and water, turned to Canada, but there too they were denied entrance. Country after country, the Jews had nowhere to run, no one to rely on. The Jews were sent home, home to Hitler. There were no public eruptions by the American people. No one protected the Jews. Human rights activists, the Jewish community, the Christian community, silence. Never again will we be at the mercy of other nations. Israel must always protect the future of the Jewish people. In the first half of 1944, some 435,000 Hungarian Jews were deported to Auschwitz. By that time, the world knew of the systematic genocide going on in Auschwitz, the largest and most infamous concentration camp. Just a few months later, the Allied forces controlled the European skies and with just a few bombs could have obliterated the railroad tracks to Auschwitz, effectively halting the murder of hundreds of thousands of Jews. Jewish communities from around the world called upon the Allied forces to bomb the tracks and destroy the gas chambers. There was no reason not to. Between July and November of that year, more than 2,800 American planes flew right over the railways leading up to Auschwitz. In August and September, American bombers hit the industrial zone of Auschwitz itself, just five miles from the camp's four gas chambers. But the killing installations in Birkenau were never bombed. Technical difficulties, they were told, made carrying such a mission impossible at that time. Every day that went by, 
every 24 hours, every day the sun set over Auschwitz, we lost 12,000 Jewish souls. We were helpless. No one saved them. No one saved the Jews of Auschwitz. Human rights activists, the Jewish community, the Christian community, silence. Never again will we depend on the help of other countries for our very survival. Israel must always protect the future of the Jewish people. We are reliving the year 1939, but this time is different. The Jewish people of old have been resurrected as the nation of Israel in our homeland. God has shined his face upon Israel once again and we are finally free. Today we're dealing with the president of a country who has publicly called for the death of every Jew and Christian and the destruction of Israel, America and the West. He has built intercontinental ballistic missiles to carry a nuclear warhead and is now moving his nuclear facilities underground. He is a hair's breadth away from a nuclear bomb. We did not return to Israel after 2,000 years to now rely on Washington or the UN. We must never depend on the help of any other country for our survival. Israel must always protect the future of the Jewish people. Stay tuned for the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem. What makes the miracles of Jesus even more miraculous? Standing where they happened in Israel. Come explore Jerusalem where Jesus opened blind eyes. Visit the hills of Galilee where Jesus fed the multitude. Stroll through Capernaum where Jesus lived and taught and healed. To learn more about standing where it all happened in Israel, visit www.goisrael.com. Come visit Israel. people were just there who might have been for the first time in their life in a meeting like that never seen anything like that and you know I look around me and I could just cry I saw how they cried and my heart was moved with compassion I saw how they felt we're not alone and I think that's what made the difference and I think that's what they need to hear more than anything else yes we're coming to this land to bless this land to bring finances to this land, to serve this land in different ways. But last night, I went back to my room and I said, Lord, show me how I can love them more because they need to know they are loved.
Jesus said, I will not come back to that city until there was not a revival here in Jerusalem, a spirit which will welcome me back to that very city. And therefore, the theme of this Feast of Tabernacle is a declaration to the nation that a new page has been opened in the history books of the nation of Israel. We believe the next big move on the nation of Israel will be the spiritual restoration of the nation of Israel. my brothers and sisters tonight, to focus that there are again Palestinian Arabs love Jesus and love Israel and standing for Jesus. Even we are paying a big price, but the biggest price already has been paid by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Because of that stand I took, our church was bombed 14 times. I was shot for bullets, and yet I'm still alive by God's grace. I want to thank everybody who participated at this year's Christian Feast of Tabernacles here in Jerusalem. Thank you for coming and joining us at this great feast. I also want to thank everybody who watched us uh, via live stream. It's fantastic that you can participate even at your home. May God bless you and remember to keep on supporting our work and ministry here in Jerusalem. We expect to see you again next year. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rom. And I'm Erin Viner, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all your Israel updates.